Well, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited about tonight's gathering and event. This year marks the 40th anniversary of John Paul II's visit to the Anchorage, and um, we're very blessed to have members of our community here who not only were there at the event, also joining us who were there at the event, but also those who helped plan and were close by when Archbishop Hurley and the entire large team of faithful put the event together. So it's a very blessed time tonight. We'll introduce our, our panel uh, members here. And again, gentlemen, we're very thankful that you joined us today. We'll start with introductions and all, but I suppose on an evening like this, especially as we, today is the seventh anniversary of the canonization of St. Pope John Paul II. And so very appropriate that we meet today. Uh, why don't we stand and begin with prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious God, on this wonderful evening, we thank you for the gift of our faith, and for the gift of the papacy, and especially remembering, as we recall, the visit of St. John Paul II, his visit to Anchorage. We ask that you continue to open our minds and spirits to see the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we might be bright with your light to share and preach the gospel in our words and in our lives. May this evening be a praise of your generosity and the great gift of life that is given to us in our Lord Jesus. We pray this through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now the hour of our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So once again, we're very happy with our thank you for coming to serve on our panel. Father Dick Taro was a young priest when John Paul II arrived. I think you were ordained for seven years right. and signed over at Our Lady of Guadalupe. And also... Uh, I don't say the Kodiak at the time. Kodiak at the time, yeah. And also helped serve on the planning committee, too, in those final weeks before the Pope's arrival. Father Michael Shields was also a young priest at the time, and uh, a uh, son of Holy Family Cathedral, born and raised and brought up in the, in the community. So, welcome, yes, welcome, Father Dick. I'm sorry. And Max Hodel was the co-chair of the planning commission for this entire visit of the Pope, with along with uh, Governor Wally Hickel. And so... Max, we're very thankful that you could join us tonight, and especially thank you for your particular role in helping bring the Pope to, to Anchorage. And so thank you for joining us tonight. And Stan Baruki has been a resident of Alaska for many, many years. And during the time of the Pope's visit, Stan was working with the Department of Immigration and through designated by the Archbishop to help that was the time during solidarity and was helping with uh, Polish immigration and particularly during the time of solidarity there was a number, I think 40 fishing vessels in the region um, crewed by Polish uh, citizens who wanted to become American and not return back to Poland. And so Stan was instrumental, the nearest place to process um, immigrants. Polish immigrants would have been Chicago. And so in the early 2000s he was designated as an Honorary Counselor of Poland to the state of Alaska. And so Stan, thank you for joining us as well. <laughs> the format of tonight's presentation is panel discussion. We've prepared some questions that to just ask everyone and see, see how people were feeling and what their thoughts are on these particular questions. But they've been invited, uh, if they remember a story or they remember someone else the guys are talking about, to please share the story that part of these questions are just to get the conversation started. We did have a parishioner, Barbara Niziol, who wanted to join us tonight, and so we, she made a brief video for us, and we're gonna start with that video, sharing Barbara's experience of the papal visit, and one more video before we begin with our panel discussion. Thank you so much for inviting me 
to participate in this wonderful program. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my memories of the uh, visit by Pope John Paul II in Alaska. February 26, 1981, what a day it was. It was a cold winter day in Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, it didn't matter. I, along with many others, was standing in front of the Holy Family Cathedral waiting to see the Pope. It was one of the most exciting days in my life. In late February, only two years earlier, I came to Anchorage from Poland. My husband and I, like many others, hoped that maybe one day we will be able to travel to Rome and visit the Pope there. But here, in the middle of winter, 1981, Pope was coming to Anchorage, and we were going to see him in our own town. Members of the Polish American community, there were probably around 200 of us, gathered under a white and red banner, and on it, it was written, Witamy Ojca Świętego, Polacy z Alaski. Welcome, Holy Father, signed, Polish people in Alaska. John Paul II was the first Polish-born uh, Pope, so you can understand how exciting it was for, for me, my husband, and for many of us who came over here from Poland, people in Poland and all over the world uh, that loved him and were very, very happy and, and proud, proud of him. So came, coming here from Poland, made it even more exciting and more special to see the Pope in, in Alaska. And there was someone very special with us. We were expecting our first child. And he was excited too, I could, I could feel, <laughs> he was kicking. <laughs> and exactly two months later, our first child, our son Sebastian, was born. Seeing the Pope just a few feet away from me, I just couldn't believe it. I will never forget him walking toward our group. He definitely noticed the white and red banner above us. And I will never forget his smiling face, his eyes filled with God's love, his hand lifted when he gave us his blessing. It was a wonderful moment. Uh, we were, we were excited. We were so, so happy. I will always remember that. It was, again, as I said, one of the greatest moments in my, in my life. And then the Pope entered the cathedral. He was going to meet with some of the disab disabled and uh, some elderly people who gathered in the basement, in the, in the lower level of the cathedral. In the meantime, everybody um, moved toward the park strip where later the Pope celebrated the Mass. And I couldn't believe how many people were there. Uh, according to some estimates, there were close to 100,000 people. It, was, it has been the largest gathering of people in Alaska. He was here for a very short time, I think only three hours. Everybody wanted to, to, to meet with him and, and talk to him. But the, the meeting in the, the cathedral with the, uh, with the disabled and the elderly took um, some time. And then, of course, there was the, a long mass on the park strip, and he had to rush back to the airport because uh, he was uh, on the way from Asia, coming back through to Alaska, going back to Rome. So it was a very brief visit, uh, but we were very grateful, everybody was, that uh, he took the time to stop and uh, meet with people and celebrate the Mass. The Pope received many gifts, and the Polish American community uh, presented him with a beautiful polar bear skin signed by many of us. So um, we are very proud that we can um, continue the Polish traditions here in our Polish American Club of Alaska. We have lots of Polish um, Americans, Polish born, Polish born people who come and join us uh, at many events. 
and we, as often as we can, we always include information about um, Pope John Paul II and celebrate uh, events that, uh, to celebrate his life. We always are happy to share this information and we always, you know, whenever we have occasion, you know, we always mention uh, Pope John Paul II. <laughs> we are so proud that, that he came from Poland, uh, Polish Pope, who is a saint now. And these are my wonderful memories of our wonderful Pope, our Pope John Paul II. Special Journal 13 presentation, Pope John Paul II, visit to Anchorage. So our very first question for the panel tonight is, where were you when you heard that the Pope was coming? And what was your first thought? What was your first response to hear that the Pope was coming to Anchorage? Um, you know, I'm just gonna hand the microphone over to you. Oh. I was in Kodiak. Surprise! It was uh, you know unbelievable. But the Pope needed gas. He uh, couldn't fly over Russia. It was a, they were the bad boys then, so he needed a uh, crossroad of, uh, of Alaska to do what was there for him. I was a young priest at St. Anthony's under Monsignor Kobo, uh, a great man in many respects who taught me a lot. And I remember when he was called uh, by Archbishop Hurley, uh, I was upstairs in the rectory and I heard this, what? <laughs> and I came down and he sat me down and said, you're gonna take the parish for the next few weeks. And um, then he poured himself a scotch. <laughs> <laughs> and said, I'm not gonna be here. But the real preparation for this was Max and, um, and Wally and Monsignor, they were the, the triune 
Every time Monsignor would come back, and there'd be another huge problem to go over. This is, was a huge preparation. And uh, I have lots of thoughts, but one is that Anchorage opened up its heart to the Catholic Church. It was amazing. The newspaper printed the Mass. The Mass was printed in the, in the newspaper. If you could follow along the Mass. So these are just some of the things that, the, that I was just so amazed at, how I was so, you said, the old priest, so proud and so prestigious to have our Holy Father and have the whole city. I'm not so sure that would happen today. You know, but back then it was an incredible gift to the Catholic Church and for a young priest like me. Max, you did so much more than any of us. There you go. <laughs> what uh, where were, were you when you heard that you were to uh, head the committee? Where were you? When you oh, got gee, I don't remember where I was. I know the Bishop Hurley got a hold of me. We got a job to do it. Got about 30 or 40 days to do it in. Mm -hmm. uh, very historic occasion. One that I feel so grateful to have been a part of. And uh, it, uh, it created an atmosphere for the city for a long time to come. details, but I uh, know when, where, and what. We looked at the facilities out of Elmendorf, the hangars, where they have the mass there. And finally, a good friend of mine, the name of Gene Rogusco. At that time, and, and he looked at me and he said, why don't we have it on the park strip? Simple as that. <laughs> and I said, let's do it. <laughs> so anyway, I think the main thing that I could like to refer to is the unusual support, welcoming, uh, encouraging, the whole community was caught up in this. And when we you know, we looked at Elmendorf and hangers out there, and I'm saying, I'm glad to have an open air deal. And a lot of people went to work building a, uh, what would you call it? A not stadium, but a place for the choir and folk and everything. It was, it was a great event. Lovely. And uh, I guess one of the best things I can say is, Every time we asked for something, nobody said no. <laughs> nobody. Yeah. And uh, the spirit of that was tremendous and what saw us through. There's been different <coughs> estimates on the number of people that attended Mass on the park strip. That's as high as 60 to 80,000. My guess is more around 40, 50,000 from what I could assess. <coughs> and reflecting on it now, it gives me goosebumps <laughs> because there's so many, many, many wonderful people. Mm -hmm. Nobody said no. Everybody said yes, yes, yes. Which defines the spirit this country, this state, this city. I was gifted and privileged to be a part of the leadership of that. And uh, all I can say is many of you here have a memory of what resulted. Like the Bible I mentioned, 
on the video was a spiritual morning. I had a phone call earlier, Archbishop Hurley called. He said, Stan, we have a meeting at the airport. Please meet, I think it was about around seven o'clock. Come right away. The Holy Father is coming. With all the excitement, I never forget that. You know, I drove there and I left my car and I was in the front of the departure. I slammed the door, you know, and here I have to go to the meeting in the car. I said, oh no. And, but anyway, that was the next two weeks, the most intensive, like Mr. Max, you know, saying, you know, meeting and being, you know, still very young to this community, being from Poland. Risen, Archbishop Hurley, you know, called me because at the time he was very much so involved with the Catholic Church and the Polish community with the Polish refugees because the situation in Poland was very tense. And, you know, the Catholic Church and the Polish community we had so much to do, to work, and I participate, and that's the reason, you know, why, uh, you know, he called me, we got very well acquainted. As a matter of fact, I still got that, that 40 years later, I got the security badge, right? <laughs> being a little guy, immigrant, coming to this country you know, and working with the Secret Service. That's <laughs> the most experienced person, never forget, never forget. <laughs> and after that, three years later, I had a chance to do, participate also in Fairbanks in 1984. But anyway, you know, that's what happened. The next the two weeks, the preparation was, you know, that I stay for the rest of my life, you know, yes, this is the beginning. With about less than five weeks of time to plan this, I understand, and Max, you might be able to speak directly to this, that a special planning committee was set up to meet every day after the seven o'clock mass here in the church basement to prepare for the arrival of the Pope. And so just asking a little bit, and those of you even associated if you weren't there at the meetings, do you recall who the representatives of the church, city, and city, and other organizations attended the morning planning meetings? What were the meetings like? You didn't have the internet, you didn't have cell phones, you didn't have laptop computers. I mean, how, how did you pull all this off in just less than five weeks? The only thing I remember is that nobody said no when you were asked to do something. The whole community is regardless of whether we're Catholic Whatever, whatever it took to build a stage, if you want to call it that, uh, all the decisions that, that were made uh, in conjunction to had morning meetings in the wait for the cathedral every day. And uh, they were attended by probably 20 or 30 people. They were all movers and shakers and doers. Marvelous experience. I had, I had a wonderful feeling, a, a wonderful aura about the whole thing. I'll never forget. And I was eternally proud of the role that I had to play in working with others. And uh, it was a historic moment, Father. It was a historic deal, frankly. How many people attended that mass and on the park strip? I've, I've settled my own mind is about forty or fifty thousand. Some of the estimates went up to sixty or seventy thousand. I think that's a little high. <laughs> but anyway, it was a last. It was a, a wonderful, wonderful event. The, the aura and the enthusiasm and the goodwill and the feeling and the smiles of people. Grateful to God for having played what 
I call a significant role in holding that. It was uh, fun, but it was exciting, and so many different issues came up, like the porta potties. That was one of the more expensive uh, uh, situations besides building the altar. Secret Service was there, and they kind of ran the show as to the route of the Pope, and uh, he came in on a Secret Service uh, limousine and then switched to the Pope Mobile that Max and his crowd had designed and uh, was you know, very appropriate. The Pope could see everything, and people could see the Pope. People like Donna Agosti, um, one of the joys was we had the old uh, government building that's now the head of the Park Service. And that was vacant, and so they turned that over to us, and we used that as the head office. The Archbishop uh, was still in the Chancery office back here. And uh, Eleanor Spurnack, who had been Archbishop Ryan's secretary, was let go, uh, or actually paid, to come and serve as the main secretary, and a lot of those operations operated uh, out of that uh, operation. So things were happening and people, they had their, they were assigned jobs that morning and they went out and did them and then they reported back the next day and said, how did you do? Did you get the porta potties? Did you, you know, that was, that was my sense that you got the job, you went and done, did it and then you come back and report it to the committee. They had a whole list of things. Uh, it was just, it was truly an exciting time to work with people who knew how to get things done. I just got nothing to add. It was just, it was amazing when she and Nicole get up at seven in the morning and the dads were <laughs> 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 every day. <laughs> My contribution to this free you know, organization was to organize the Polish communion there. And we came to conclusion, I never realized that we have so many Polish people. <laughs> there was approximately 300 people, you know. And in the front, what is the parking lot, you know, we, they line up, they line up, and when the limousine arrived, you know, the schedule was that, that the Pope was going directly to the front of the cathedral. But we had a big sign, the Polish people welcome Holy Father, and the son, God save Poland. And when he heard that, he just put the Secret Service in the side, you know, <laughs> and the rector goes a nightmare, you know, for the Secret Service. <laughs> and he came, you know, to shake all the not all of the people that are front, you know. It was a the most experience and also security because anybody could be another side, you know. And uh, yeah. and after you know shaking head, what was interesting? My mother in law, who's American, you know, she is not Catholic, but she was there to shake also her his hand. And when he, she came at a home in the evening, she said, he, he is not ordinary man, he is unusual. The eyes kind of penetrate him. And she had a problem with her arm, rheumatoid arthritis, something, you know. She could not lift the right hand for a long time. She came home, went to the kitchen, and took the pen and lifted the pen, you know. That's, Little miracles happened, you know, she could not believe it that I'm not being a Catholic, you know, but you know, something experience like that. But anyway, the preparation, my contribution was to organize the Polish people and a principle, you know, how we can express our appreciation, how, what kind of gift, what kind of gift we can give it to Pope, you know, that. And we came to the conclusion to get him polar bear skin. <laughs> and we were able to secure, I don't recall the doctor, there was a one doctor who had it, the polar bear skin, and we bought it that for $4,500. We collected the money, we purchased it, but we had a, all kind of permits from fishing game department, all the two weeks time you know, to prepare that, that he can take it. I wasn't present at the place where before the mass, 
at the strip, but the recording to the, some witness when he walked in at the bed, kind of lying on the floor watching him, <laughs> and he took his shoes off, went to the place, the bed, <laughs> and he said, Marcinko, Cardinal Marcinko, I wanted that in Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> Another one really made it now to confirm that the skin went, the bed went to Vatican. Father Larry, who married us, he was visiting there one day, and he saw the bell that was in his place, in other words. That was my contribution, our contribution, you know, you know, to that, you know, okay? Father Terror brought out some wonderful video coverage, and we'll share a little bit more um, for those at the end of our meeting tonight, but um, it includes a television interview with you, Max, about how and why you designed the Pope Mobile the way you did. And it's, a, it's about a five minute clip, but we'd love to share that with the community here at, at the end of the evening. One of the um, logistical issues that came up is that even though the Pope was coming, they still need an alcohol license to have alcohol on the park strip. Believe it or not, um, Mrs. Augusty in her television interview actually said that. She said there was no problem getting it, but they had to apply for one. I thought that was, I thought was very interesting. And also, uh, Father Dick, you might be able to contribute more on this, that ARCO loaned one of their senior executives to help. Eleanor Spurnack was Archbishop Ryan's secretary, and she had, uh, because Joanne White was Archbishop Hurley's secretary, she left ARCO and given uh, the uh, rights to, they kept paying her, and, and she went over and helped us. So that was So we noticed in the video there was some coverage about the, the service. Actually, it was a papal address here at Holy Family Cathedral. And there much was spoken about um, visiting the handicapped who were also invited. But apparently upstairs as well, there were some priests and religious and sisters and some dignitaries from all around the country. And um, there were some other events too. And so I'm curious, do you remember some of these special, other special guests, other than the Pope, who came up to Alaska for the visit? No. <laughs> Can I talk about my experience at the cathedral with the Pope? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, I was in a, a side row for Monsignor's, of course, to have the, the chosen place beside uh, the, the uh, aisle. So I elbowed my way close to Monsignor Cobra. I was right beside him. I, I, you know, you're, you're saying he was a special man. He was a saint, and when he came into the cathedral, you could feel the energy of this man as he entered into the cathedral. You could feel his holiness. I, I understand what holiness is after that encounter, what the power of that was. First of all, he didn't. He was walking down the aisle, then he came on our side, and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, he might stop and say hi. But it's okay. <laughs> Welcome, Holy Father, to the land of Alaska. I had about a five-minute talk that I was going to give the Holy Father. So he walks by, he stops, turns around, looks at a long period of time, pointed his finger, walked up, and put his hand out. And I put my hand out, and I said, "Wow!" <laughs> and he walked by. <laughs> so that was an impression of this young priest. And a wow is appropriate response to a holy person. Wow or awe, awesome. After he visited us, he went and prayed before the Blessed Sacrament. He was constantly there anywhere that he, he, he went. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a John Paul uh, priest. I was raised under his orthodoxy. I was running under his mission. My own priesthood is formed on who he is and what he was for the church. And he was a, a courageous missionary. And that, that's what I saw here dropping into a place of Alaska, for goodness sake, why? Because the whole world was his uh, gospel. The whole world was his, it was a place to preach. So I, um, as a young priest, it, it made a huge impact on my life. And I think maybe a, a, some missionary zeal came later uh, from some of that in, encounter. But yeah, wow is the best I can do. <laughs> 
Father Steve mentioned uh, special dignitaries. I was telling him that when I was working in the office, um, we were getting, everybody had to have a badge, depending on where you were going to be. And so we were giving badges out to the sisters and priests in Alaska, and then we had some priests outside that wanted badges and bishops, and you know, who, who gets one, who doesn't get one. One of the famous ones was Stan Usual, flew up with Cardinal Kroll and he wanted a badge to get in. And so I guess we got him something at the altar, but not into the upstairs uh, cathedral. That was reserved pretty much for invited guests and for the priests and sisters uh, in Alaska. And one of the disappointments was he, he walked up and he sh shook Father Shields' hand, and my hand, Father McCarran's hand. But yeah, Father Dan. Father Dan, but he was, uh, we had, everybody expected him to switch from side to side and shake the hands of the nuns. And he thought that he was going to be coming down the same aisle after the service, but they escorted him downstairs to meet the elderly and the handicapped. So the nuns were really they rightfully ticked off. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, the great treasures downstairs was meeting with little Molly Marie Jordan. And she had cystic fibrosis. She was uh, about five, six years old. She was supposed to be in our first grade class in Kodiak. Her parents, uh, Jean and, and Jack, had moved out to Kodiak. He worked for Fish and Game. But her health had yeah. disintegrated, huh? Yeah, yeah. It, they had, uh, her health had disintegrated, and so she never got to go to school there, and she, uh, and get, on her own, she gave, uh, wanted her mother to get forget-me-nots and gave those to uh, Pope John Paul. And the year later, when we went with the choir, the Pope's message was, I will never forget Molly Marie, and I will never forget you. And I just, you know, because I knew the story in the background. She had died. Well, how did the word get to the Pope? Archbishop Hurley said, I didn't write it. The Jordan parents said it. We didn't. It was the grandmother who had sent a letter and it got through uh, 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 Father Deepich and it got to, uh, to the Pope. And uh, it was an amazing story. Yeah. Amazing story. I uh, buried uh, Molly. Jack recently and their son. Um, the other thing that was really amazing, the miracles that I, I know there was a couple of women who had uh, pregnancy problems and the Pope blessed and the children corrected themselves in their womb. And the most popular baptismal name after that was what? John, John Paul. I baptized three babies, John <laughs> Paul. <laughs> Does anybody want to say anything? guests came and who were some of those people we always we, we just don't know some of the others a lot of people came up from the lower 48 we understand but we we just they're never listed in any of the, the we had three cardinals cody from chicago kroll from philadelphia and madeiras from boston and the, the one of the fun times was night the night before the pope came wally hickel hosted a party at his place mark's Max and Joanne were there, and we had all these senators and congressmen and cardinals that were just, you know, hobnobbing with the hoi polloi. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Kodiak, and I was lobbying one of the senators, I think it was Hale Boxer's wife, for a new dam in Kodiak so we could have power and get rid of the diesel. We would have the electric electricity from this dam. So. You never know what's, what's, what, what can happen when you're out rubbing elbows with the, with the uh, mucky muck, so to speak. <laughs> Did you want me to say anything more? 
How was the party, Max? How was Remember the party? The party? Yeah, well, I tell you, the spirit of the community was universal. Nobody said no when you asked for help of any kind. It was, it was amazing what, what a marvelous feeling it was, you know, working with this project, you know, on your first visit. And uh, anyway, uh, Anchorage uh, should be proud the way it hosted the Holy Father and how it affected our whole community. And I'd love to do it again. <laughs> Pope Francis will ask Francis to come. If you will, if you will chair it, we'll ask Francis. <laughs> Thank you, we have a whole second set of questions to ask. And also, I think we have some members of the community who, with your own memories and own questions of being there, putting pieces of the puzzle together. I know that we have the contractor here who <coughs> built the stage and the area along with one of his workers, one of his carpenters here joining us and our community members. And so, um, but so one final question before we, we take questions or comments from the community here. And then we have, um, you know how you always hear how there's the official history of an event, and then there's the secret history of an event. <laughs> well, some unnamed staff members this afternoon came up with some questions wanting to know what the secret history is <laughs> of the Pope's visit to Anchorage. But before we do that, and before we take uh, questions from the community, um, it was only three months later that John Paul II uh, was shot. And what was the response? How did people feel here just having seen the Pope up close and personal, and having him so close and being filled kind of with that life that he brings that Father Michael was speaking of. <coughs> what was kind of, how did, what was your thoughts? When did you hear about it? And how did it, did it affect what people were thinking in relationship to the recent visit from, since the Pope had only been here a few months before? The reality of, of, of that what happened in terms of, I mean, it was a world event. Uh, Alaska was an Alaska event, and Holy Father became personal to us because he was right in front of us. And so the, when he was shot for myself as a young priest again, it was, uh, I remember crying. And, and, and whether he would make it or not, whether, I mean, everybody was realizing that. I, I, I Again, just my impression when he was on the park strip I realized that moment Alaska was having the gospel preached to it. Every station, every TV, every radio was hearing the gospel. The city was being converted. And I, what, what that, that sense of his presence uh, at that time and then pre preaching the gospel and just, it, it, when, you're, when you're that kind of a presence in the world, um, when he was shot, I, I mean, just, it's like taking out a, a large figure for everyone, so I don't know, I just, yeah. I think the most meaningful moment was when he, afterwards, when he reconciled with his uh, person who shot him, that was amazing. That, that was so much later, but um, an image for reconciliation for all. Just that for now. Wow, that's the first one. <laughs> remember when the Holy Father was shot yeah. and do you remember your reaction yeah. I mean I, mine was very sad obviously and well I was stunned just stunned, stunned is the word for yeah stunned is the yeah, word stunned. when the Holy Father was shot three yeah. months later I think especially for the Polish people the tremendous tragedy of war because, you know, the Holy Father established good contact, had a good relation with the President Reagan. And, you know, and when we learned about that, you know, there was the most unbelievable things. 
because the whole future, as we know later, depending you know, on these two men. And what led, you know, three years later to the meeting in, in Fairbanks, 1984, you know, they met together. There was a no translator, no interpreters, only two of them. And there was a final preparation that really put the Russian empire, you know, apart, you know, and the, the whole collapse of the Soviet system and uh, the whole Eastern Europe got free, you know, without any revolutionaries, without any shot, with anything. And the important, the kind of special, that he was naturally Holy Father, but the political, the future, you know, what was uh, depends on his, you know, survival, you know, yes. Yeah. I'm sure people know that the bullet that was in the blow to the heart was placed in the crown of Our Lady of Fatima uh, because the Holy Father believed that Our Lady uh, protected him. And so it was shot on the 13th of May, which was yeah, which is the uh, feast day. So he took the bullet after he was hung and placed it in the crown of Our Lady in Fatima. So go to Fatima. So do we have questions from the community or thoughts or experiences that members from the community would like to would like to share or ask the panel? I have a thought. Um, I was a senior in high school when the Holy Father came and I remember the complete excitement. I mean, when you're a senior in high school, you think nothing tops seeing the group America in concert, or going to see, uh, you know, I don't know, all the other concerts that came up here, but I remember being at the park strip, and we were like 10 people deep from the stage, from the altar, and that day, I knew that there would be no one in this world ever that I would look up to anymore than him, he did, he radiated. There was something about him that even at my young age and my younger sibling, it just, we floated the rest of the year. It was so amazing and I remember being so proud to go back to school and be a Catholic. It was, it was the most amazing thing. And then another thing that happened when my parents found out that he was coming, um, all of my siblings flew home. We had married siblings that lived on the East Coast. We had siblings away at colleges. And my mom and dad brought, and I have a huge family. And <laughs> my mom and dad flew everyone home, all the grandkids, everybody. So we were all here on the park strip. And wow. it was such a unifying experience. And so it, it just solidified the, the faith. Yeah, we were half the park strip. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> but, and another thing I wanted to say was, I didn't realize at the time, um, Archbishop Hurley had this ability to um, pull the community in no matter what, no matter what was going on. If, if it was an earthquake, if it was, you know, uh, whatever it was that had happened in the community, he was always front and center and he was such a leader in that way. So it doesn't surprise me to hear now, which I didn't realize then, how he was able, like, like Max said, to generate such enthusiasm, uh, not that the Holy Father didn't himself, but to have that, that the three amigos that put this thing together, it, it amazes me. And I, it makes me even more grateful to Archbishop Hurley for all that he did and, and the way he reached out to so many people, Catholics and non-Catholics alike. And I learned something the other day that I didn't know because I didn't know my husband at the time, but his mother was there and she wasn't even Catholic. She had, she had talked about how she had come to the park strip, and I didn't know that. She, was a, she didn't have a faith community at the time, and, and she ended up dying a Catholic, by the way, <laughs> buried in the church, and, and so anyhow, it was just very beautiful, and that's my memory, so. Anyone else? Uh, 
Um, I wanted to share a, a connection three years later with Joanne and Max that was really special. Um, in 1981, the plaque on the outside of the cathedral, when I first came, it was in the 1990s, but there was a plaque on the outside of the cathedral about the Pope's visit. And it was very special, the year. And I'm gonna add this because with Father Shields, it was, was in Russia, and all of the background was Poland. I was in Mexico at the time, and September of 1981, all the banks were nationalized from the Rio Grande to the Straits of Magellan in Argentina, in South America. And we had, I coordinated the dialogue that finally, the Alaska portion of it with the Holy Father was really critical because there were meetings going on at the presidential levels between Mexico and the United States. And then we had in Mexico City, a very large Polish community that was supporting um, Lech Walesa in Poland and the solidarity. So we had t-shirts that a lot of us would be wearing in Mexico City when this critical situation was happening in Poland. So then also um, Gorbachev um, came to Minnesota in 1990 and I happened to be there but uh, on the press pool of eight. And it wasn't until I came and saw the plaque and had an opportunity to spend some lovely time with Joanne that the whole circle internationally came together. And it, it's, it's not something that is necessarily written about uh, because the, the 1,800 banks future was on the line. But Alaska had a very important part in, in, in being a place for the Pope and the President of the United States to meet. So that's just another little aside. But Max and Joanne uh, were fantastic. I mean, I love their stories they shared. Forgot to mention Roberta is a Hickel, so we have to mention that it was her Hickel family that went without saying. So we, well, everybody does, but we're being joined by viewers at home, so we wanted to. I was in sixth grade at the time, and um, we were singing in a, a grade school choir on the park strip, just waiting for the Pope to, to arrive. But I'm just gonna go further that uh, later when I was in college, I attended Thomas More College of Liberal Arts in New Hampshire, and we had a Rome program. So we um, uh, were able to go and study in Rome for a semester, and we were given tickets to go to one of his weekly audiences, and um, we were kind of right up in front. And we knew we might have an encounter with him because the photographers, the Vatican photographers, were handing out their cards, like, oh, if you get photographed, you can come to the office. And, you know, purchase it. So anyway, um, he gave his address and then he was moving along and um, I had the same thought you had, <laughs> that, you know, what is he, what if he stops? And he did, he stopped like right at me and everybody was reaching out and trying to grab his hand. And I was just stunned, like, what am I gonna say, right? And so he said, uh, where are you from? And I said, um, from the United States. And he said, where in the United States? And I said, Alaska. And his face lit up like, like he had this memory of being in Alaska. And he just reached out and he just touched the side of my face. And that feeling of just like encountering holiness uh, and floating, I just like we floated out of, out of the auditorium. He was very, very holy and just magnetic. And there was something about his eyes, you know, that just radiated Christ, really. So. <laughs> okay, I think the next couple of questions, instead of passing the microphone, you guys just can say what you're thinking. This is the secret history versus the official history. Um, Alaska Catholics want to know. Question number one. Did the Pope eat anything while he was here? No. 
not to my knowledge. He didn't have any time. Two questions. Did he have a meal while he was uh, Did the Pope here? eat Did anything? Did the Pope have a meal? He had no time. They whisked him from the airport to Holy Family. Uh, and as soon as after Holy Family, he rode the Pope Mobile to the park strip, had mass, and went right back out. At the airport, remember, he had a chance uh, to drive a dog team. And he drove uh, a Norman Bond's dog team. Norman was sat in the basket. And the Pope drove it out from the, uh, the Pope drove the dog team from uh, the terminal out to the uh, plane and then got off and went up the stairs. But it was uh, no time for eating. Because it was an hour of fasting before the Eucharist. Right? <laughs> Which leads to the other question. How many people here either received communion from the Pope or know someone who did? Wow. Please stand up. I received from the Pope. That's good. I know somebody who did. So who received, of this number, who received from the Pope? I'm sorry. Did you receive Eucharist yes, from the Pope? Yes, yes. Max, yes. Max, Max received. Oh, yeah. Joanne, Joanne received. Yes. My husband received. Bob received. I have a beautiful Pope. picture. How did he receive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a deal. What was that? Wow. How did Bob receive? Why did he receive? And how? Did he get home? I wasn't a Catholic. Oh, that's right. <laughs> no. But I, I consider myself married to a third order relic or something. <laughs> <laughs> Parish was given uh, two two spots. So, like I had uh, the two nuns in Kodiak, and they, if you were going to go, you could put your name in the hat, and if you were lucky, you had two spots because we had every parish in Alaska as a possibility. Then the people on the committee and other chosen people, and it was about a hundred, I think, that received uh, communion from the Pope. And how did they choose the one hundred? From, the from each the parish was given two, two spots. And so, like I had probably 20 people who came from Kodiak, they put their name in the hat in the parish, and then the two nuns actually won the spot. And so we- well, Rick's uh, was in. Rick. <laughs> it was Rick. And it so was uh, we sent the names up here, and then they were given badges for the communion spot. Question number three, and this one is for Max. I'm sorry. Here, this question's for you, Max. Did the Vatican ask you to build the Pope Mobile? Did they what? Ask you to, to build the Pope Mobile. Oh, no. No, that is our, our idea. And uh, uh, it worked out very well. I, I took a new GM3 pickup and had Capitol Glass build a shield for it to shield him from the weather, made out of plexiglass, and uh, it worked out very well. Where is it? Well, uh, the pickup fell up and the valley bought the pickup. Uh, I don't remember what, who, who it was, but I didn't want to know. I just, uh, I knew that. He bought it, and, and that's the last I heard of it. But it was a quite a deal, Father. I guess one of the things that struck me most in, I, in my memory now is the enthusiasm and the willingness of everybody to help to do what they could. And it was a sincere and, uh, and very, very wonderful experience. Now to this very day, there's a rumor alive in the state of Alaska that says before his departure, John Paul II gave his hat to someone and left it behind and that it's still somewhere around in the archdiocese. Do you know anything about the hat? So when he came back in 84 to Fairbanks, he wasn't coming back to get his hat. <laughs> Okay. I'm not familiar with that at all. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, that was somebody just mentioned to me, hey, didn't he leave his hat with someone? And is it, maybe we could get the hat for this evening that we're having we have, tonight. We have the chalice and the vestments. Chalice and the vestments, yeah, and that's over right. The, yeah. Over the chest region. That's right, that's right. They were in the museum, and then the museum gave them back to the archdiocese. So. Well, I want to thank the panelists tonight for joining us and sharing with you your experiences of the Pope's visit um, to Anchorage. What a historical moment. There's wonderful displays inside. There's some of the, we have a copy of the newspaper that has the entire mass listed. There's pages and pages about his visit from the day before, the day of, and the day after. So if you, if you want to stop by and take a look at some of these articles or come up and ask our panelists some specific questions, Probably, um, after a final prayer, we'll probably watch, there is that wonderful news clip, Max, that is just really wonderful, and it describes your reasoning behind designing the Pope Mobile and everything, and it's actually, it's very, very nice video clip that I think would be fun to watch. But um, I forgot to ask people, we have copies of a prayer to St. Pope John Paul II, and maybe if we kind of pass out some of those copies, we can pray that prayer together. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Uh, David, would you introduce the um, with our carpenters and uh, designers for the stage? systems in there, blowing you know, nauseous fumes to keep it warm for paint to dry. Um, the, the part about that point in my life was my, uh, three weeks earlier, my first daughter was born. Uh, she was born premature, and I had been living out on Nelson Island in that fall and had to come to Anchorage for her birth, which was uh, an emergency thing. So late January, she's born, and for a month or more, she was in an incubator down at Native Medical on Ferry. So I would go down there at the end of working on the stage uh, every day to visit my daughter in an incubator. So I was able to actually tell her I was prepping a facility for the Pope to come, and I said, if you would say a prayer for her, that someday I could hold her outside of that incubator. That was just the uh, beginning of her life. And the, Pope, the Pope's visit to me was pretty special. I spent a lot of, a lot of a lifelong Catholic, and my mother's Polish. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think Mr. Hazlitt could probably speak to the effort that our side, uh, you know, there's probably, I don't know how many people
We didn't question it or anything like that. We just, as, as the gentleman has said many times, uh, we just enthusiastically pursued the project and it was, you know, a once in a lifetime opportunity to, uh, you know, to do something uh, significant or, or we thought it was and I'm sure that, that you do too. Thank you. How many people were on the crew? How many people helped build it? Remember? Days were you working? How many days did you? I don't know. Dave, do you remember? Uh, I want to say eight to ten. Yeah. And then the kicker is how close to his the arrival of the plane was the stage finish? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was, that, 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 right. I, 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 I knew that was one of the, that was another thing that this was happening, and uh, but it wasn't happening. I mean, this you know there that had not been taken care of. I, I'm sure that they were desperate or they would not have come to us. <laughs> <laughs> so there we were at the last minute trying to put this thing together. And uh, we were probably more painters than we were carpenters. <laughs> and uh, so if the building fell apart later, uh, you know, all I can say is paint is not structural. <laughs> <laughs> the sound system was uh, an incredible operation. I'm not sure whether they were Anchorage people or they were flown up from the lower 48, but they were testing that the night before. Archbishop Early said, you know, they could hear him all the way to his house, but it, it reached out a good half mile and it all worked perfectly. I mean, and that's, that's a heavy duty sound system. I just want to something a little bit lighter about it. You know, like the Bible say, ask and you shall receive it. When the Pope walking to the cathedral, my wife, you know, she uh, was American, but she not only Polish, Papa give me a kiss. <laughs> and he did, you know, she was one of the legacy. <laughs> but she been kissed by the Holy Man. <laughs> that, that, that was a good one, you know, she had the greatest memory in her life. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Well, please let us thank our panelists for joining us tonight and for their lives, and especially for your service, Max, for your service in helping bring the Pope to Alaska. And so we thank you and thank you again for joining us tonight. We are very much. I think we all have a copy. This is a prayer to St. John Paul II. So I, I invite all to stand and we can recite, we can pray this prayer together. O oh, Saint John Paul, from the window of heaven, grant us your blessing. Bless the church that you loved and served, and guided courageously, leading her along the paths of the world in order to bring Jesus to everyone and everyone to Jesus. Bless the young who were great in passion. Help them dream again. Help them look up to the heavens again. Divine the light that illuminates the path of life here on earth. May you bless each and every family. You warned of Satan's assault against this precious and indispensable divine spark that God lit on earth. Saint John Paul, with your prayer, may you protect the family and every life that blossoms from the family. Pray for the whole world, which is still marked by tensions wars and injustice. You opposed war by invoking dialogue and planting the seeds of love. 
Pray for us so that we may be tireless sowers of peace. O St. John Paul, from heaven's window, where we see you beside Mary, send God's blessing down upon us all. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And again, just a few minutes, we'll run that video. And please, the displays are wonderful pictures of the events that was shared with us, shared with us tonight. Thank you for coming.